Hello, this is Dr. Emma Gatmaniaski from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. Welcome to this educational activity focused on updates in allergic and inflammatory diseases that were presented at the American Academy of Dermatology or AD annual meeting in San Diego as well as the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology and the World Allergy Organization Joint Congress or QUAD-I in Orlando. Specifically, I will be exploring data for atopic dermatitis treatments that were presented at both of these meetings. Joining me in this initiative is Dr. Whaley Song from the Alabama Allergy and Asthma Center in Birmingham, who will be discussing new data in asthma, nasal polyps, and eosinophilic esophagitis presented at the quad -AI. The following audio is part of a certified educational activity titled, Moving in Leaps and Bounds Towards Precision Immuno-Oncology latest biomarker strategies to guide patient selection and maximize the potential of cancer immunotherapies. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerview.com forward slash UPW. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Moderate to severe atopic dermatitis significantly affects the quality of life of patients due to each lack of sleep embarrassment, social isolation, and effects on mental health. Therefore, we must be able to effectively treat this disease. The management of atopic dermatitis is still evolving, with the recent FDA approvals of two new agents, as well as a variety of novel therapies under development. Let us discuss the new data for these treatments that were presented at the AAD and at the quad -AI. We'll start with Crisaborol, a topical phosphodiesterase inhibitor that was approved for the treatment of mild to moderate atopic dermatitis in patients that are at least two years of age. Data for this treatment was presented at the AAD. The long-term safety and efficacy of Crisaborol was assessed by race and ethnicity in the phase three studies. Improvement in global disease severity at day 29 were similar in all racial and ethnic groups as were well rates of treatment emergent adverse events and group discontinuation because of treatment emergent adverse events at week 48. This finding suggests that crisaborol is an effective and well-tolerated treatment option regardless of the race or the ethnicity. Let's move on to dupilumab, a subcutaneously administered monoclonal antibody directed against the IL-4 receptor alpha subunit, consequently inhibiting the actions of both IL-4 and IL-13 cytokines, which are key drivers of type 2 immune diseases such as atopic dermatitis. Dupilumab is approved in various countries for the treatment of moderate to severe inadequately controlled atopic dermatitis. In the SOLO-1 and SOLO-2 phase 3 studies, Dupilumab monotherapy significantly improved signs and symptoms of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, including itch and sleep disturbance, symptoms of anxiety and depression, quality of life, and also demonstrated an acceptable safety profile at 16 weeks. Since recent evidence suggests that IL-4 receptor alpha affects cutanosensory neurons and mediates chronic itch, a temporal analysis of these studies was conducted to determine the proportion of patients achieving at least three or four point improvement in the peak pruritus NRS score from day two through day 28. And these results were presented at the AAD. A significantly greater proportion of patients receiving dupilumab versus placebo achieved at least three-point improvement in the daily peak pruritus NRS from baseline as early as day three or day four. All subsequent time points for each dupilumab treatment group through day 28 had a significantly higher proportion of responders relative to placebo. Similar results were observed for patients achieving at least four-point improvement from baseline. These results are important as each, as we all know, is the most bothersome symptom reported by patients with atopic dermatitis and can severely interfere with their sleep and quality of life. Other analysis of these studies sought to determine whether patients not achieving the FDA definition of success, which is an IgA score of clear or almost clear, had improvements in better validated disease severity measures and quality of life. Among these patients, improvements in easy score, body surface area, pruritus, pain, 
patient reported outcomes and quality of life were observed. More patients achieved IgA of 2, which is mild AD with dupilumab, whereas significantly more patients reported IgA 3 and 4, moderate to severe AD basically, with placebo. These results suggest that the IgA scale underestimated the efficacy of dupilumab in these studies. While IgA 0 or 1 can be a valid clinical outcome as a disease state consistent with clinical remission, the upper portion of the scale, IgA 2 or 4, lacks the sensitivity to discern important and significant differences between study groups. Other analysis of the SOLO-1 and SOLO-2 phase 3 studies assess the efficacy and safety of dupilumab in atopic dermatitis patients that have or do not have various comorbidities. Results from these studies were presented at the quad -I meeting and showed that dupilumab was effective regardless of comorbid food allergies, asthma, or allergic rhinitis. Data from a phase 2A study with GBRA13 adult patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis were presented at the AAD. Patients received two repeated doses, each 10 mg per kilogram, administered IV on days 1 and 29 with a 56-day follow-up. GBRA30 treated patients displayed significant reductions in mRNA biomarkers of disease activity compared to baseline and placebo, which was the primary endpoint. Clinical improvement was also associated with a reduction in these biomarkers, indicating an effect on atopic dermatitis disease profile. Change in easy score in GBRA30 treated patients separated from placebo from day 15 and was maintained during the course of the study up to day 71. In the GBRA30 cohort, 17 out of 23 patients achieved easy 50 scores at day 57 versus baseline, a key secondary endpoint of the study. GBRA30 was generally safe and well tolerated with similar incidence of adverse events between the treatment arms. In summary, GBRA30 has a novel mechanism of action and may target both Th2 cells and regulatory T cells. It has the potential to be a disease-modifying agent with long-term efficacy. However, we definitely need validation in larger studies. ANB is a first-in-class monoclonal antibody targeting IL-33 cytokine, a central mediator of type 2 diseases that is highly expressed in the skin of atopic dermatitis patients with active disease. A late-breaking presentation from a proof-of-concept phase 2A clinical trial of ANB020 in 12 adults with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis inadequately controlled by topical corticosteroids was presented at the AAD. Rapid and sustained clinical responses were observed and were accompanied by relevant changes in granulocyte migration into skin. However, there were some confounding factors. The number of patients rescued with topical corticosteroids remains unclear and is very relevant. NB020 was generally well tolerated. Overall, NB020 potentially represents a new therapeutic option for patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, and further studies are needed to validate this study. MOR106 is a first-in-class monoclonal antibody targeting IL-17C, which induces expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines, mediators, and antimicrobial peptides in epithelial cells, and it is increased in atopic dermatitis. Late-breaking phase 1 data for MOR106 were presented in California. 25 subjects with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis received 4 weekly infusions with a 10-week follow-up period. At the highest dose of 10 mg per kilogram, 83% of patients experienced an easy 50 response at week 4, compared with 17% of patients in the placebo arm. MOR106 was well tolerated with no safety signals detected. These findings support further clinical development of MOR106 for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Evidence for the emerging role of JAK inhibitors in atopic dermatitis were also presented, including late-breaking phase 2B data for upadicitinib, an oral JAK1 specific antagonist. This dose-ranging study is an ongoing 88-week phase 2B randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study that evaluates the safety and efficacy of upadicitinib in adult patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis that are not adequately controlled by topical treatments or for whom topical treatments were not medically advisable. 
Results demonstrated that the mean percent change in easy score from baseline was significantly higher than placebo in all those groups at week 16, the primary endpoint. The proportion of patients achieving easy 50, easy 75, easy 90, and IgA of 0 or 1 were also significantly higher in all upadicitinib groups compared with placebo. The most common adverse events were upper respiratory tract infection, atopic dermatitis worsening, and acne. No herpes zoster, malignancies, deaths, or cases of pulmonary embolism or DVT were reported in this study. Overall, JAK inhibitors seem to have potentially a better safety profile in atopic dermatitis patients compared to rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis patients, but of course we need larger and longer studies. Late-breaking data for baricitinib and oral JAK-1-2 inhibitor were also presented in San Diego. In a phase 2 double-blinded placebo-controlled 16-week study, the effect of baricitinib on patient-reported outcomes in moderate to severe atopic dermatitis were assessed. Rapid onset of action was observed in the easy percent change from baseline with 2 and 4 mg doses looking very similar in efficacy. Compared to placebo, both paracetinib doses showed statistically significant improvements in the mean POEM scores starting at week 1, but only the 4 mg group was significant at week 16. Analysis of patients with more severe disease at baseline with an easy above median of 21.2 showed significant improvement for the 2 mg dose at every time point during the study. Significant improvements in scorad pruritus at week 1 and scorad sleep and DLQI also occurred at week 4. By week 16, more patients in both baricitinib dose groups than placebo reported clear, almost clear, or mild eczema as measured by the POEM score of 7 or below. Baricitinib was overall very well tolerated. There was a numerical increase in adverse events on the 4 mg dose, which was mostly driven by nasopharyngitis and upper respiratory tract infections, headache, and elevated CPK. Phase 3 studies in atopic dermatitis patients are ongoing. ASN002, an oral dual inhibitor of JAK and C kinases, is also being investigated for atopic dermatitis. Targeting the JAK family leads to inhibition of cytokine signaling and cell proliferation in response to cytokines. Targeting SICK leads to inhibition of IL-17 signaling, CCL20 production in keratinocytes, and keratinocyte terminal differentiation, and B-cell and dendritic cell differentiation. The safety, tolerability, preliminary efficacy, and pharmacokinetic profile of ASN002 in patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis were also presented in a late-breaking study at the AAD. Results from this four-week phase 1b study showed that ASN002 was well tolerated at all those levels. The most common adverse events were transient, mild headache, and nausea, mostly restricted to day 1 of dosing. In terms of efficacy, ASN002 resulted in improvements in easy 50 and easy 75 in the 40 and 80 mg doses. Improvements were also observed in body surface area and IgA assessments in mid and high dose groups. Additional studies are warranted to further discern the efficacy and safety of ASN002 in atopic dermatitis. So in conclusion, data presented at the AAD and quad AI confirmed the efficacy of crisaborol and dupilumab. Crisaborol was found to be effective in various uh, racial and ethnic groups, and its effects on pruritus appear to correlate with its improvement in quality of life. Dupilumab was found to be effective regardless of the presence of other atopic comorbidities, and its efficacy was demonstrated through parameters not taking into account with the investigator global assessment endpoint, which may have resulted in an underestimation of this agent's efficacy. Additionally, many novel treatments being investigated for atopic dermatitis seem promising and have the potential to further personalize the care of patients with this disease. Well, that ends the discussion for atopic dermatitis. Please do not forget to tune in to Dr. Song's presentation on asthma, nasal polyps, and eosinophilic esophagitis, which will begin shortly. Thank you. Hello, this is Dr. Whaley Song from the Alabama Allergy and Asthma Center in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm going to be discussing updates in asthma, nasal polyps, and eosinophilic esophagitis that were presented at the Quad AI. 
A significant portion of patients with asthma are not controlled with inhaled medications. Many of these patients are dependent on oral steroids, which can be associated with serious side effects when used long term. Targeted biologic therapies can provide opportunities for these patients to achieve asthma control and limit their use of oral steroids. Options for targeted asthma treatments have recently expanded and will likely continue to expand in the light of numerous therapies in development. Data for these agents were presented at the Quad AI. A variety of studies evaluating strategies to predict response to omalizumab were presented. Findings from a post hoc analysis of the ICATA study showed a significantly greater response to omalizumab in terms of exacerbation reduction among children with increased asthma severity, which was consistent with observations from previous studies. A post hoc analysis of another study of patients with moderate to severe persistent allergic asthma showed that response to omalizumab was observed across a wide range of baseline eosinophil levels, but patients with baseline levels of at least 300 or 400 cells per microliter had a more pronounced reduction of asthma exacerbations with omalizumab compared with placebo. An analysis of the Prospera study showed that in a real-world setting, patients treated with omalizumab had improved asthma control with decreased asthma exacerbation and increased ACT scores regardless of baseline IgE levels, suggesting that al although important in omalizumab dosing, IgE may not be a predictive biomarker for response to omalizumab. Data for these new anti-IL-5 therapies were also presented. Mepolizumab was approved in 2015 for add-on maintenance treatment for patients with severe asthma aged 12 years and older with an eosinophilic phenotype. Mepolizumab has been shown to improve lung function, asthma control, and quality of life and is associated with reductions in exacerbations, symptoms, and oral steroid dose. Many studies on mepolizumab were presented at the Quad AI, including a combined analysis of two phase three studies, Mensa and Musca. This post hoc analysis assessed the effect of mepolizumab on morning peak expiratory flow utilizing refined criteria to select patients based on approved product labeling. The mean change in morning peak expiratory flow was 26 liters per minute in the mepolizumab group compared to four liters per minute in the placebo group, a significant difference. When the population was stratified by eosinophil thresholds, the data suggests that higher eosinophil counts are associated with greater improvements in morning peak expiratory flow. Another study sought to identify patients who would respond to mepolizumab and determine a phenotype for response to mepolizumab. This analysis used an extensive database of 260 severe asthma patients, 74 children, and 186 adults. Of the adults, 75 had childhood onset asthma and 111 had adult onset asthma. This study found that severe adult onset asthma appears to be a distinct phenotype with frequent exacerbations, eosinophilia, and nasal polyps compared with pediatric asthma and adult asthma with a childhood onset. 35% of the adult onset patients had eosinophil levels of at least 500 cells per microliter compared with only 15% of the other groups. It is not clear when monoclonal antibody treatment should be targeted to IgE versus IL-5 in patients with allergic eosinophilic asthma. Therefore, a retrospective analysis was conducted to identify phenotypic features of mepolizumab responders and determine whether mepolizumab was effective in asthmatics who failed to respond to omalizumab. Of the 27 patients treated with mepolizumab, 15 were monoclonal antibody naive and 12 were previously treated with omalizumab and did not respond. 20 of these patients responded to mepolizumab and allergic asthmatics who did not respond to mepolizumab did not differ by baseline specific IgE, total IgE, blood eosinophil level, lung function, or other clinical parameters. 
Of the patients who failed to respond to omalizumab, 75% met criteria for response to mepolizumab. Therefore, mepolizumab may be effective in allergic asthmatics who did not respond to omalizumab, but better biomarkers are needed to predict response to each medication. OSMO is a phase four study investigating the efficacy and safety of mepolizumab in patients with severe uncontrolled eosinophilic asthma following a switch from omalizumab. Some late-breaking results from this study were presented in Florida. Over the 32-week treatment period, the ACQ5 score improved by minus 1.45 points, with 77% experiencing the MCID of at least 0.5 points. The SGRQ improved by minus 19 points, 79% experienced an MCID of at least 4 points. Least square mean pre and post bronchodilator FEV1 improved by 159 milliliters and 120 milliliters respectively at week 32. Clinically significant exacerbations and exacerbations requiring emergency department visits or hospitalizations were reduced by 64% and 69% respectively. Blood eosinophil counts were decreased 76% from baseline to week 32. Overall, 86% of patients experienced adverse events and 11% experienced serious adverse events. Post-baseline anti-drug antibodies were present in 8% of patients. No neutralizing antibodies were detected. These results were comparable to previous trials of mepolizumab, where not all patients had received prior omalizumab therapy, suggesting that mepolizumab is effective regardless of prior omalizumab use. These findings provide reassurance to clinicians considering the substitution of one biologic with another. In an effort to gain insight into real-world use of mepolizumab and omalizumab, a study examined baseline demographic, clinical, and healthcare utilization characteristics in patients 12 months prior to first mepolizumab or omalizumab administration in an employer-based insurance claims database. The cohorts included 413 mepolizumab and 1,834 omalizumab patients. Prior to receiving mepolizumab, patients had a higher number of exacerbations and greater healthcare utilization and cost, suggesting differences in disease severity and burden compared with patients receiving omalizumab. Another real-world study for mepolizumab was conducted in Chicago. Charts of 28 patients who received mepolizumab for asthma were reviewed and characteristics from six months prior to starting mepolizumab were compared to those six months after starting treatment. The mean age of patients was 51 years and 75% were female. In accordance with clinical trials, mepolizumab resulted in a significant reduction in the number of asthma exacerbations and in oral corticosteroid use. There was a small but significant reduction in lung functions as measured by FEV1. On physicians' global assessments of asthma control, nearly all patients improved. There was a high prevalence of comorbid chronic rhinosinusitis and approximately half displayed improved chronic rhinosinusitis control with mepolizumab. There were minimal adverse effects related to treatment. A small study presented at the Quad AI sought to determine the clinical efficacy of mepolizumab on asthma and sinus symptoms in patients with AERD. At least three doses of mepolizumab improved upper airway symptoms, including nasal congestion and anosmia, and asthma control in patients with AERD. Therefore, the benefit of mepolizumab extends beyond the lower airway and should be examined prospectively in patients with AERD. Resolizumab is an intravenous administered anti-IL-5 antibody that is approved for severe eosinophilic asthma in adult patients. A post hoc analysis presented at the Quad AI evaluated baseline differences between patients in the highest and lowest quartiles 
of change in FEV1 in patient reported outcome measures. Data were pulled from two 52-week placebo-controlled trials of rezolizumab in patients aged 12 years and older with inadequately controlled asthma and eosinophil levels of at least 400 cells per microliters. Baseline blood eosinophils and ACQ6 scores consistently indicated patients in the highest quartile for improvement in lung functions and patient reported outcomes with rezolizumab. Oral steroid use was associated with FEV1 response in a later age of onset was associated with responses for patient reported outcomes. These findings indicate that patients with poorly controlled asthma at baseline and an eosinophilic phenotype could be expected to gain the most benefit from rezolizumab treatment. Another post hoc analysis of these trials showed that rezolizumab was consistently effective at improving FEV1 regardless of the number of historical clinical asthma exacerbations experienced in the past. Significant improvements were sustained up to 52 weeks. The greatest improvements in clinical asthma exacerbation rates and lung functions were observed in patients with the greater number of historical clinical asthma exacerbations. These findings suggest a possible physiological association between exacerbations and lung functions in patients with severe eosinophilic asthma. Another post hoc analysis of these studies found that compared with placebo, the duration of clinical asthma exacerbations was significantly shorter with rezolizumab and the overall clinical asthma exacerbation burden was reduced over 52 weeks of treatment. Findings in the subgroup of patients with severe asthma in either high-dose inhaled steroids plus another controller or additional previous exacerbations were consistent with the overall population. Reductions in number and duration of clinical asthma exacerbations may be associated with shorter hospital length of stay and lower healthcare utilization. An additional post hoc analysis, rezolizumab significantly improved scores for individual ACQ5 questions at 52 weeks compared with placebo. Pulled data from the two 52 week phase three studies also showed clinically meaningful improvements in additional lung function measures, FVC and FEF2575. Improvements in FVC were observed as early as four weeks. The increase in lung functions observed may be indicative of a reduction in air trapping and recruitment of small peripheral airways. Benralizumab is the most recent targeted therapy to become available for asthma. It inhibits the interleukin-5 receptor alpha. Benralizumab was approved in late 2017 as on-on treatment for severe eosinophilic asthma for patients aged 12 and older. A few studies of this agent were presented at the Quad AI. One was a post hoc analysis of the Kalima and Sirocco studies, which assessed the efficacy of benralizumab in patients with severe uncontrolled eosinophilic asthma and nasal polyposis. Compared with placebo, benralizumab every eight weeks displayed enhanced efficacy in the subgroup of patients with nasal polyps as determined through exacerbation rates, lung functions, ACQ6 scores, and quality of life scores. Another post hoc analysis of these studies evaluated seasonal variation in the frequency of asthma exacerbations and the reduction of exacerbations with benralizumab treatment. The observed crude rates of exacerbations were greater for fall in winter compared with spring and summer for all treatment groups. Benralizumab significantly reduced the frequency of exacerbations compared with placebo by 37% to 50% during each season. In another analysis of the Sirocco and Kalima studies, it was observed that benralizumab every eight weeks produced rapid and sustained increases in morning peak expiratory flow for patients with severe uncontrolled eosinophilic asthma. This agent showed faster improvement in morning peak expiratory flow within the first week of treatment compared with placebo. 
In both trials, benralizumab treated patients achieved a clinically meaningful average improvement in peak expiratory flow within the first three weeks. ALISE was a phase 3B randomized controlled trial assessing whether benralizumab modifies the antibody response after influenza vaccination in adolescents and young adult patients with moderate to severe asthma. Patients were aged 12 to 21 years old, receiving medium to high dose inhaled steroids and bronchodilators. They received benralizumab or placebo at weeks 0, 4, and 8, plus a tetravalent influenza vaccination given at week 8. Antibody responses were assessed at week 12. Benralizumab had no apparent effect on antibody responses to seasonal influenza virus vaccination in adolescent and young adult patients with moderate to severe asthma. Data for emerging asthma treatments were also presented in Orlando. Dupilumab inhibits both IL-4 and IL-13, key players in type 2 inflammation. Positive phase 3 data for dupilumab in uncontrolled persistent asthma and severe steroid-dependent asthma have been recently announced. At the Quad II, results from a post hoc analysis of the placebo cohort of a phase 2b study of dupilumab were reported. This analysis was conducted to understand the relationship between severe asthma exacerbation rates and type 2 related biomarkers. Patients in the highest quartiles for pheno, periostin, and eosinophils experienced numerically higher exacerbation rates during 40 weeks of observation. The interpretation was less clear for IgE. The use of combination of biomarkers enabled identification of patient subgroups at higher risk of severe asthma exacerbations, particularly patients with higher levels of pheno at baseline and higher levels of periostin, eosinophils, and IgE at baseline. The extent of overlap in subgroups defined by elevated biomarkers suggests that individual biomarkers do not reliably flag the same patients and that there is little relationship between elevated pheno and elevated IgE. Tezepelumab is a monoclonal antibody targeting thymic stromal lymphopoietin, or TSLP, and is also under development for asthma. TSLP is an IL-7-like cytokine, which triggers dendritic cell-mediated inflammatory responses, ultimately executed by Th2 cells. Results from a 52-week phase 2b study of tezepelumab in patients with severe uncontrolled asthma were presented at the Quad AI. A total of 584 eligible adults were randomly assigned to subcutaneous tezepilumab, 70 milligrams every four weeks, 210 milligrams every four weeks, 280 milligrams every two weeks, or placebo every two weeks. Mean improvements from baseline in ACQ6 at 52 weeks were significant for the medium and high doses. Significant improvements in ACQ6 scores were observed in all tezepilumab groups compared with placebo groups. Greater proportion of patients in the tezepilumab group were either well controlled or partially controlled at week 52. The median time to first partially or well controlled asthma was reduced by half in tezepilumab groups compared with placebo through 52 weeks. Imatinib inhibits the tyrosine kinase receptor kit, which is central to mast cell survival. A proof-of-concept trial of imatinib in patients with severe asthma was presented in Florida. Findings suggested that Im inhibiting mast cells with imatinib may decrease the extent of airway remodeling in patients with severe asthma, especially in those with significant airflow obstruction. The kit pathway therefore shows promise for future drug development targeting airway remodeling and its underlying pathology. Let's move on to discuss nasal polyposis. Type 2 mediated atopic diseases are frequent comorbidities in patients with chronic rhinocytositis with nasal polyposis refractory to intranasal corticosteroids and patients with these comorbidities experience numerically higher baseline levels of type 2 biomarkers. 
Some of the previously mentioned targeted therapies are also being investigated for the treatment of nasal polyposis, including dupilumab, mepolizumab, rezolizumab, benralizumab, and omalizumab. Data for rezolizumab were presented at the Quad AI. One was a retrospective review of three consecutive patients receiving rezolizumab for the treatment of refractory eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis with eosinophil count of at least 400 cells per microliter. After eight weeks, a significant reduction of the Lund-Kennedy polyp scores of at least one point was found in all three of the patients. Mean polyp scores improved from 8.6 to 4. Decreased SNOT-22 scores were observed in all patients with mean improvement from 62 to 33. None of the patients required interval oral steroids for rescue of breakthrough nasal symptoms. No adverse events were reported secondary to resolizumab therapy. Additional prospective studies with longer follow-ups may be required to fully discern the effects of resolizumab in these patients. A late-breaking study was also presented which examined the effects of resolizumab on nasal polyp inflammation in a patient with AERD. Compared to patients not receiving resolizumab, resolizumab was noted to result in reduced peripheral eosinophils, nasal polyp eosinophils that were less activated, reduced expression of nasal polyp eosinophil granular proteins, elevated number of nasal polyp mast cells and basophils, and evidence of increased activation of nasal polyp mast cells and basophils. Revision sinus surgery was required for this patient, suggesting that other cell types, including basophils, may play an important role in AERD pathogenesis in this individual. This is believed to be the first study to assess the inflammatory environment in nasal polyposis before and during resolizumab treatment in the same patient with AERD. Let's now discuss eosinophilic esophagitis, or EOE, another allergic inflammatory condition that involves eosinophils. The relationship between eosinophilic esophagitis and the atopic march, which describes the natural development of atopic dermatitis, IgE-mediated food allergy, asthma, and allergic rhinitis has been unknown. A case-controlled analysis with propensity score match controls was performed to establish if the presence of these conditions modifies the risk of developing EOE. Results show that the peak incidence of EOE occurs after that of atopic dermatitis, food allergy, and asthma, and is statistically concurrent with allergic rhinitis, fitting with known associations between these conditions. Atopic dermatitis, food allergy, and asthma independently and cumulatively increased the risk of subsequent EOE, while EOE increased risk of subsequent allergic rhinitis. These findings indicate that EOE is a late manifestation of the atopic march, and these results have implications for the use of novel treatments that target Th2 pathways. While this condition does not have an approved treatment, studies have investigated agents targeting IgE, IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, and CRTH2. In conclusion, developments in asthma are occurring at a fast pace with newly approved and emerging targeted treatments. Many studies presented at the Quad AI examined the effectiveness of therapies in specific populations which can help to discern appropriate patient candidates for these agents. Treatments targeting the Th2 pathway also have potential to be used in other allergic and inflammatory conditions, such as nasal polyposis and eosinophilic esophagitis. We are excited to see more data in these diseases. Thank you very much for participating in this educational activity focused on updates in allergic and inflammatory diseases presented at the Quad AI. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www.peerview.com forward slash UPW. This activity is supported through an educational grant from Bristol-Myers Squibb.
This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.